Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new um, episode of our series Empathy Conversations. My name is Haifa Stedi. I am the founder of Empathy for Peace. We are an organization that's dedicated to creating a more peaceful world through empathy. And we do that by connecti connecting empathy research to practical um, uh, real world applications in uh, peace building and conflict transformation. I am here uh, joined today by my friend and colleague, Simon Baron cohen and our special guest, uh, Monica Douglas. Welcome, Simon. Welcome, Monica. Simon, I know last time uh, in our first conversation, we talked, at, you know, we talked a little bit about Empathy for Peace and about yourself. Uh, but just for people who are tuning in for the first time today, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself, um, and then I'll ask Monica to do the same. Sure. So um, I'm Simon Baron Cohen. I'm a psychologist at Cambridge University, um, and uh, I'm privileged to be one of the directors of the charity Empathy for Peace. Um, and I've done research into the nature of empathy, um, and I'm very interested in how we can translate what we learn from the science into the real world to promote more empathy. Thank you. Um, and Monica, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Monica Douglas, and I'm an interfaith minister and spiritual counsellor for people of any faith or none. And for me, what's brought me to um, this conversation is that I'm very passionate about how we can embody and live our values. And for me, empathy has a real opportunity for us to bring more peace, more um, a, of a sense of humanity to us um, so that we're able to foster a new way of being that actually is one that we've not had before. And I feel we've got a, a window, a particular window after having the experiences that we've had over um, lockdown and um, the coronavirus over this year to look at how we present ourselves in the world, how we act in the world. And um, I'm really looking forward to exploring this conversation, particularly around um, the concept of race and racism and how we can use that as a catalyst for growth. Yeah, thank you, Monica. And thank you both for being with me today. I know um, in today's conversations, we didn't wanna talk about racism and the role of empathy um, that uh, plays in that. And I, for, um, you know, for I think for us, um, the the idea of wanting to talk about that is kind of in the context of uh, Black Lives Matter and the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd. And I know, um, at least for myself, when I was watching the video, reading about the event and and the killings of, of many other Black men in America, um, and you know even here in Canada, uh, to me the question that kept coming up is how could anyone um, have that level of cruelty? How do we get to this point where we have seemingly zero degrees of empathy? Um, uh, and so, uh, Simon, uh, like, I'm interested from like, a neuroscience perspective, how, do we, how does a human being get to that point where we are able to inflict that level of cruelty on another human being? What's going on there? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think um, starting the conversation with the murder of George Floyd is a really good place to start when we want to try to understand how can human beings do this to one another. Um, and also, you know, just watching the news that day, what, did, what, what impact did it have globally, you know? Um, and yeah, it raises these big questions because, you know, here was a man who was, who was repeatedly saying, I can't breathe. And yet there's another human being, you know, kneeling on his throat, on his neck and, you know, stopping him breathing with a, a look on his face of, of um, lack of care, lack of compassion, lack of empathy for another human being. And yeah, we, we do need to try to understand how, how, what are the factors that could lead that policeman, that white policeman to do that to a black man? Uh, you know, are they social factors? Are they partly biological factors? But I'm much more interested in the social factors, given what we know about the history of, of racism and, 
treating black people as subhuman. Not, not just in America, but in many countries, including uh, my own country. Hmm. Yeah. So if we look at the kind of the history and where did that start from? The, this idea that, you know, some people can feel superior to everyone else because of the color of their skin. Um, well, for me, to, to justify transatlantic slavery, there was a systematic um, approach of um, academics um, and throughout society to dehumanize black people. And um, that has continued over centuries and has never really been deeply looked at, has never really been um, fully examined by many, by most people, um, up until now, even even till now, there's been a lot of activism um, around racism, but it felt to me at that pivot point where we globally could observe the murder of a black man, that somehow it's opened people's eyes to this unconscious um, systemic racism that we've been swimming in, we've all been bathing in, breathing in, eating and drinking over many centuries. Monica, Monica, how unconscious was that systemic racism, given slavery was, was, in, was a, whole, a whole system? It was very conscious, wasn't it? It's very conscious, but the question that we have now is how unconscious is that in me in terms of the way I act in the world? So I can say that as a black woman with an African Caribbean heritage, that I've had to do my own work, having been re-traumatized by watching that video and tapping into actually what is what is in me. And I suppose that's what I'm my invitation to the um the watcher or the listener of this podcast is how what is in me that still believes that which I have been fed through society, through my family, through my my genes about the inferiority or superiority of one human being above an un, uh, another because of the amount of melanin they have in their skin? Hmm. That's the question. Yeah. yeah. But I think, I, think, you know, I think what happened with um, with the eight minutes of film footage that fortunately was captured by a passerby on their mobile, their cell phone. You know, it, it documented what is still happening and what has been happening for hundreds of years yeah. to black people in America. But, yeah. that, but that today, that global response is to say that is not acceptable. When, if we went back 50 or 100 years, people might have walked by or they may not have come out in a global protest in the same way. Yeah. And, and for some, for some of us, it tapped us into deep feeling, which for me, you know, this is what this empathy conversation is all about. It's like when I watched that video, this could have been my brother, my father, my lover, myself. Mm -hmm. And for for some, they made that connection. Yeah. For others, they didn't make that connection. You know, there's still people who... Um, I think you're saying that as a, as a black person, viewing the suffering of another black person, it was easy for you to identify with... It was, it was impossible for me not to identify. Not to identify. And, but what I think, and, and that is a different experience for me as a white person watching, but where it was incredibly painful to watch. And yet I think we, we all had to force ourselves to watch that, that news footage in order to understand the kinds of atrocities that are still going on, that in some ways are no different to the kind of lynchings that would have happened a hundred years ago in America, or the shooting of a, uh, a black slave that a slave owner would have felt entitled to do. Yeah. I think, again, that to our empathy is really um, interesting to think about because I also know, like, I've heard from many mothers 
who also identified um, strongly with with the video when he called out for his mother, right? Yes. And so I think there's different ways that people were able to emphasize um, through watching that video based on their own experience and, and what's happening for them. And I, all, I also wonder if, you know, the fact that it was a video, that we were able to watch it and hear it and, and really see it has helped with, with that level of empathy. Because you're right, Simon, it's not like this is a new thing. This is something that has been happening, continues to happen. But how come we're, you know, all of a sudden we are empathizing more, we're noticing more, we're hearing it more? Is it that, you know, what, what makes us empathize more or less with, with something? Um, is it the video or is it something else that was happening for us that all of a sudden now our empathy is kicking in where it didn't before? I, w I also wonder whether it was the context of when. So we'd already been in a period of lockdown. Mm -hmm. So our senses have been heightened. Uh, we've been through an experience of being isolated from our loved ones and not being able to interact with each other. And then to have those images placed in front of us. Um, and then also to see other people's reaction to it, the the polarization that um, existed, yeah. um, the people the people who denied that it even happened, to the people who went out on the street and marched. Yeah. But I, and, yeah, I remember when I was growing up that we didn't really have the concept of racism, let alone anti-racism. You know, I think it's a new kind of consciousness. And although America presents itself as being uh, everyone is equal, clearly that's not happening. We can see that in so many different areas of American society, and that may be true in many other societies, including Britain. Of course. <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think the big response, the big global response was, was partly driven by empathy, you know, for the victim, that this is outrageous, and also a kind of consciousness that, you know, that racism has to be, you have to stand up against it. You know, if you, if you see it publicly, if you hear examples of it in the workplace, you have to speak out. Whereas that wouldn't have been true. And there wasn't a kind of concept that this was bad. This, yeah. I think this is what you mean by, by the kind of, um, the unconscious side of, of racism. It was normalized. Yeah. It was no, it was normalized. I think like the 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 um the point um Monica you raise about the timing is really interesting for me because um again like thinking about empathy um one of the things that covid-19 the pandemic and the lockdown I feel has made is it it um really brought to that feeling of the global village like all of a sudden we were all in the same you know the same thing in the same place and the thing we know about empathy is that it is much easier to empathize with people you count in your circle and in your group and I wonder if that pandemic has just expanded what we consider to be our group and our circle and yeah. that level of kind of like expanded empathy um, then we watch a video like that and it's so much easier to think of of you know to think of everyone who, even people who normally we would have thought are different, to think of them as of our, in our circle, in our global village, in our community, we're all in this together. And here is someone who is being killed, not because of the pandemic, but because of something totally different. And it's so much yeah. easier to then, you know, have that feeling of empathy and outrage, uh, outrageousness. I agree. And I think um, I wanted to pick up on something that you said earlier in terms of those that empathized with the, the the essence of that video because of the call for the mother mm -hmm. because i think the idea of the universal mother it taps into an archetype for us all you know we're here we're born through the mother and um i don't i feel that there's something in that in terms of uh, an opportunity for the future because that that's that um that universal family 
Mm. I think we moved into the space of being a universal family by virtue of us all experiencing the pandemic together, which is a un very unique moment for well, us. You're also saying that, that George was somebody's son, you know. Mm -hmm. um, George was, the, you know, was somebody's brother, was mm -hmm. somebody's, you know, had, had parents. He was, he was a, a human being. Uh, whereas the white policeman who was kneeling on his neck was treating him as an inconvenience or as, you know, needing to make a statement about, I think, white superiority. You know, that, that, that concept is still there. Yeah. You know, even though we think of it as like an outdated concept, you know, when, when the white police do that to black people in the street, they're making a statement about who's in power yeah. and how they can treat people almost as objects, not as, not as, a, as someone's son or brother. Yeah, and I, I think we can see that. And, and I, I think it's very easy for people to sort of locate that only in the US, you know, cause it, because and it's just, it's just not true. I, I've been working, you know, I'm based in, in Britain. I've been working with um, leaders all across Europe around this. And there's still a sense of denial that this, this, is, this is here. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, I, when I was working, um, in social justice and equalities at the time of the C Stephen Lawrence inquiry, you know, if you really look at it, we haven't moved that far. No, it's very depressing. It's, I mean, it's the same in Canada. There is, you know, this sometimes the attitude that, thank God, we're not the US and we're better. Uh, but in fact, we're not really better. It's just, you know, a right. little bit more covert, uh, you know, under the surface. But that racism is still there, yeah. the systemic racism I, is still there. I think, there. you know, although the phrase white supremacy, not many people would publicly identify with it. But I think this is what you mean about the unconscious racism. Yeah. That people, mm -hmm. might, people might have inherited these concepts, including the white policeman who, who basically killed George Floyd. He may have inherited this concept yeah. of white supremacy. And maybe I responded to it because as a Jewish person, Jews were labeled as subhuman, just like blacks were labeled as subhuman. You know, and what is it that when a, when a society does that to another group, what is it that it, it, that, that idea then allows them to do, to treat them as if they don't matter? So the very notion of Black Lives Matter, you know, we shouldn't even need to say it, they matter. But, but when you dehumanize another, another group or another individual, you're, you're acting as if they don't matter. Yeah, and I, I guess this is where the call to, um, to empathy really comes in. Mm -hmm. And yeah. every, all of the hashtags and the sound bites are problem, problematic by virtue of the fact that they're reductive. Um, and yet they highlight something that's very important. And, you know, it's called a lot of people into an exploration or a discovery of, you know, some people into um, to anti-racism education and looking at their own unconscious bias and, you know, all of these things. And what will really make a difference is when we show up differently. Yeah. And... Um, mm. And I think this is where Empathy for Peace really comes in because it's encouraging us to show up differently and examine our behaviour and examine our actions in a way that the mere academic study of something may not actually make a difference. Because I think, you know, this is what's happened. There's a lot of people that have gone, oh, I'm going to consume this knowledge. I'm going to read these books. I'm going to do these courses. Yeah. And then what happens? What happens? Does it isn't it still important for people to watch something that happens in 2020 and realize it's the source, the source of the ideology that, that, that led the policeman to be able to do that is hundreds of years old. <laughs> and we, we, we do still need to look at the legacy of slavery, that mm -hmm. slavery wasn't something that just finished when they passed a law saying slavery is abolished. You know, the, the, the legacy of that is still here. Yes, yeah. unexamined in many ways. For sure. and maybe we could talk a little bit about, 
you know, how does that legacy still express itself even in the 21st century? Well, there's a lot of debate at the moment around um, a prison in America and how actually, you know, and there's a fabulous movie that people may want to watch around, it's called 13th, which talks about this history and how the current penal system has essentially evolved out of the uh, the need to control labor and ultimately black people um, after the abolition of slavery. Yeah. And, and, and that the mechanisms and the processes and the, um, the forms and ways of controlling people have just moved through the centuries. Yeah. It's, it, look, it may look different, but the basis of it is the same. For me, it feels like one of the ways that transition from the abolition of slavery into we're going to um, need to control the black people because, you know, in the, um, is, is about the archetype of the major threat to civilization to um is the archetype of the black man and um that still um looms like as, as being the core threat you know public enemy number one right and how, how yeah. did that ever come to be you know how was the stereotype created that a black man is something to be afraid of when he's no more threatening than a white man or a man of any color, right? Or a person of any color. But this stems from this systematic racism, this process of building into the psyche of that which is needed, usually for an economic imperative and to create control and order. And we have to um, examine how much of that conditioning still exists within us. Yeah. The same as the the archetypes of a Jewish person. You know, we know we know all of the things that need to be hap need to to be created. The propaganda, the imagery, the stories, everything that needs to happen and continue to be rolled out and trolled out in order for these um, dehumanizing tropes to continue to exist. Yeah. And we know that one of the things that like make um, make um, empathy suspended in our brains is um, is fear and going into that stress response, right? And mm -hmm. and so it you know it makes sense like to to create this fear mongering thing in order to for ourselves, but for others as well to accept this dehumanization. For me, I always think about like all the mass shooters in America, the white mass shooters are somehow always arrested alive, you know, with yeah. all their civil rights protected and, and fair trials, yet you have um, a black person with a counterfeit, I don't know, $50 bill and, and he's dead. Like, yes. what, you know, if you're talking about fear mongering, a man with like giant machine guns to me is the scariest yeah. thing there yeah. is. Um, and yet, you know, these people can still have their lives. Um, they can still be alive and they can be trialed. And, um, uh, but yet um, black men don't have that privilege. And one, of the, and one of the arguments in this documentary, 13th, which I do recommend to anyone listening, um, is that, you know, today black people could be arrested for the smallest crime. And yet once yeah. they're thrown in jail, they lose all their rights, even the yeah. right to vote. Yeah. Um, and that because many of the jails are privatized in the US, yeah. they are put to work just like the slaves were a century ago. Yeah. They're put to work for companies, but they're doing it inside prisons instead of um, on somebody's plantation. Yeah, they're, they're doing it in a, in a more, in a legal way, right? Versus... Yeah. Um, Sorry, Monica, did you wanted to say something? Yeah, no, I, th I think uh, for me, it's this, how do we move yeah. um, into a new era where we, because for what, what happens to one if, in, impacts on us all. And um, we're all enslaved until we release this yeah. pattern, mm. this, um 
insidious illness, mm. which is what I call it, um, which which prevents us from stepping into our full humanity. I felt the moment of the George Floyd murder, it was a catalyst for like a worldwide response. But the, the danger is that it, it got treated as just one moment and then it kind of fades. But I've been kind of impressed that even where I work, but in many workplaces and in many public institutions, the whole Black Lives Matter campaign or movement is forcing institutions to like re-examine their own practices. Why have we got an underrepresentation of black people in this sector of, of the workplace or this part of society? So every, you're, you're right, it impacts on all of us. And there's a kind of duty, a responsibility on all of us to kind of not just let that moment of, empathy, of universal empathy happen, which was that incredible outpouring, you know, protests in every city across the world, every town, but how do we keep that whole, that, that whole process of change happening? Because we've got a long way to go. Yeah, we do. And it's, it's about all of us as individuals and then working in our communities and our families to enable this to create a shift in us. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was reading something the other day, I can't remember the name of the, the author, but it was about, you know, we can see this as something that can be a long struggle or we can choose to um, really focus our attention on this and use it as a catalyst for us opening up our hearts and our minds and acting differently in the world. But we, mm -hmm. we in order for that to happen, we need to do our work. Yeah. And yeah. we need to do it not just at a, an intellectual level, but as a, at a felt sense of... <laughs> increasing our empathetic ability. Yeah, I think um, for me, Monica, like you, like some of my own work has been looking at what subconscious or unconscious biases do I have that were, you know, given to me as part of my upbringing and just the society that I, I live in. And I um, remember listening to um, a, a neuroscientist um, who said that one of, one of the, the studies he, he looked at was just making people aware of their biases was sometimes enough for them to then like, you know, have less of that bias. So I think the work we all are called to do is be more open and welcoming to opportunities for us to be more aware of our biases. And I think we often want to shy away from that. You know, we're ashamed of admitting that we may have a bias, but in fact, the more productive approach is to embrace that because once you know you have something then that's where the work actually starts where you know working asking the questions and and re um adjusting and changing your ways so that you're yeah you're you're moving yourself in the world in a way that's less mm. supportive of those biases and those discriminatory systems Definitely. and and to recognize that these you know like racism is a construct it has no um well, you, do you mean race, the, the concept yeah. of race? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, the concept of race itself yeah. and the, that that has come from it. Yeah. You know, race is a construct. And we can, as, as much as something can be built very quickly, it can also be released very quickly once you see that it's smoke and mirrors. Yeah. And therefore, then we can start to break down the um, structures of racism. I wanted to um, come back to you, Haifa, because both Monica and I have, have, have said a little bit about um, how when we watched the George Floyd murder, we were watching it from our own different perspectives. And I wondered, you as a Palestinian woman, mm -hmm. what, was, what was the lens that you were seeing this through? Yeah, it was, you know, what was interesting is after that, um, there were a lot of my um, friends and family who live in Palestine sharing images that are very similar, images of IDF soldiers kneeling on the necks of Palestinian men mm. and, and young boys. And so for me, I immediately identified with that. I know the feeling of being treated mm. like you are subhuman because of you know who you are. Yeah. Um, so I think... Um, 
every Palestinian was able to identify with that. And I think for us, it yeah. was like, yeah, we know how that and feels. That's really important. You know, in, yeah. a, in our last empathy conversation, we focused on the role of empathy in the, in the Middle East conflict and particularly yeah. Israel-Palestine. Yeah. And although many Israelis would think of themselves as good people, the question is what happens when they're put into the role of being the soldier in the occupied territory yeah. and they have weapons, they have greater power over another human being. Yeah. In other words, this isn't just about whether no. you're... Yeah. And they have the same, the concept I, of fear, right? You know, it's you're, about... You're... It's about the, 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 the Palestinian terrorist who might yeah. have a knife, who's coming to um, stab yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, and again, how, how do, you know, potentially very good Israelis recover their empathy, very good people recover their empathy so that they don't just, like, switch it off when they're in that position of being uh, called up by the military service uh, to patrol in the West Bank or in Gaza and suddenly become capable of acts of cruelty, going into somebody's house, you know, dragging them into the street, using physical violence, as if this person is not, no longer a person. Yeah. And it, it's very hard because I think the very, um, like the, the, the training that people go through is designed to strip them of that empathy. So you have to work very, very hard to regain it or, or yeah. keep it or yeah and does that mean that institutions like the military and like the police also need to have empathy conversations absolutely i think these institutions are anti-empathy like that's yeah. that, that's how they are able to survive and function so the training is and this is the point the training is specifically to desensitize yeah and to reduce people's empathy for the other for the enemy um, until we have a sea change that isn't about promoting war and otherness, that, that will continue to exist. So maybe in a future empathy conversation, we could invite um, a general from the army or a head of police to think about, yeah. is empathy important in their soldiers, in their police officers? Yeah. You know, is it, is it okay? to kind of sanction that, it, that you can lose your empathy when you're in combat or when you're in the situation of crowd control, that it's okay to, to suddenly treat people as objects? Or should, that, should this conversation be happening within those institutions too? You know, when we're trying to create a better world, yeah. we have to look at these structures as well. The, that is a, an excellent topic for a future conversation. And in fact, I, I think I know, I've, I've read about a couple of um, police departments in America that have rechanged the way they train um, their new recruits with a more of an empathy-based approach, and they've actually been really successful. So definitely, mm. I think, more to think about here. Um, and then just in general, I think uh, as we come to the end of our conversation, I think what I'm hearing we're, we're maybe leaving our um, audience with is how important it is to look inside and do your own work. Think about what subconscious biases you may have. Um, expand that circle of empathy by, you know, going out and meeting and knowing people that are different from you. Um, and continue to support mm. the dismantling of, of systemic racism, which, you know, we can't do one, uh, on our own. It, it's going to take all of us. So I think um, maybe that's where we'll leave it at. I'm going to um, thank you so much, Simon and Monica, for joining me today. I know this is not an easy conversation, not an easy topic to talk about for any of us. So I really appreciate you um, showing up today and, and having yeah. this chat with me. And thank you to everyone um, for um, joining us today. And we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>